Good evening. My name is uh, Zach Carter. And on behalf of uh, John Jay College of Criminal Justice, I'd like to welcome you here for uh, what I think is going to be an interesting and provocative panel. And we're this evening through an exploration of an extraordinary book called Failed Evidence uh, by uh, uh, David Harris, a professor at, at uh, University of Pittsburgh Law School. We are going to put the criminal justice system on a psychiatrist's couch in order to explore the reasons why uh, members of law enforcement cling stubbornly to beliefs about the reliability of certain practices they use in the area of extracting confessions, uh, eyewitness identifications, fingerprint comparisons, when there is compelling evidence based on reliable science that uh, discredits uh, the methods that they've used, particularly through DNA. And hopefully, by the conclusion of our discussion, we will uh, be able to suggest uh, some solutions to, to this problem. Leading off will be um, our honored guest, David A. Harris. Uh, and then I will uh, introduce the, uh, the, the rest of our panelists. Good evening, everyone. So nice to see all of you here. I want to thank uh, all the uh, great people from John Jay that made this event possible, uh, particularly uh, President Jeremy Travis, uh, who uh, uh, took this along and uh, got us here today. I'm really, really grateful. If you looked at almost anything in popular culture or in uh, the news, uh, you would get a strong idea that science and law enforcement are in a partnership. For every image of a police officer in sort of a, a traditional pose, you know, putting on cuffs or pointing a weapon or something, there are at least 10 images of a police officer with a test tube uh, and a microscope and all kinds of scientific gadgets. And I would like us to examine that and examine it critically. What attracted me to this project in the first place is you had all kinds of science that was being ignored, except this isn't the high-tech look in science. This is science on the very basics of what police do. Science on interrogation of suspects. Science on eyewitness testimony. Science on more traditional forensics, things like fingerprinting, like the, uh, the analysis of tire treads or shoe prints or bite marks. And yet, what we find is that law enforcement resists this science. And what I ask in this book is why? What's the reason for that resistance? Why do we have it? So that's where I'm headed. Uh, there have been 297 post-conviction DNA exonerations in that time, 297. Uh, and keep in mind that there is testable DNA in a relatively small number of cases. Something less than 5% of all cases even have the opportunity to test the DNA. So 297 confirmed post-conviction reversals. 75% or almost three quarters of those cases feature a faulty eyewitness identification. 50% feature some kind of faulty forensic work. And more than a quarter, 27%, feature bad confessions, false confessions. What is so intriguing about the science that is out there now is that it does two things. It both, both tells us what is wrong with some of our basic procedures and supplies solutions. One really good example. Eyewitness identification. Number one is the difference between a simultaneous lineup and a sequential lineup. This is a simultaneous lineup. This is an old picture, but it's the traditional thing you see from TV and the movies. That is a simultaneous lineup. Everybody is there for the witness to see at once. We know from the work in this field that when you do this, you introduce a certain degree of error from the process of relative judgment. 
Whereas, if you use sequential lineups, if you had each of these people come to the witness through the glass one at a time, most of that error would disappear. All right? So this is an, a, a, a great example of where the science points out the error and gives us a solution. Next. Uh, blind versus non-blind lineups. Uh, a, a, a lineup is essentially an experiment where somebody shows the witness a series of choices, one, two, three, four, five, six, and says, do you recognize anyone? We know from years of solid experimentation and solid science that when the person running the lineup or the experiment knows who the suspect is amongst the five or six people, knows who the right answer is, we know that the witness is going to pick that person more often than when the person showing the lineup does not know the right answer. Okay, interrogations. If you had, if you had made this statement up here, 25 years ago, I think a lot of people would have laughed. But people do confess to crimes they did not commit, even when there's no abuse, uh, they're sober, and there's no mental weakness involved. It happens. How do we know it happens? DNA. It happens. We know it happens. Why does it happen? Because of the extraordinary pressures that can be brought to bear in the interrogation room. When that's happening, People can feel so pressured that they'll do anything, including confess falsely in order to get out of that room. So what we know is that there are some ways to combat this. First, record it. You know what that thing is, right? Just record the interrogation, front to back, not just the part with the confession. You'd be surprised at what a difference this makes. There are some states that have mandated this for a while, so we have real data on which to rely. Um, deception and in interrogation is allowed. It's legal. The Supreme Court says so. It's been the rule for years that police are allowed to lie in interrogations. But the science tells us that certain types of lies about certain things are much more powerful than others. If you say to somebody, your buddy's in the next room and he's giving you up, you better take your chance to talk right now. That's one thing. But if you say, we found your DNA at the scene, even though we couldn't process it for weeks, we don't reveal that. We found your fingerprint on the knife. That was your blood over there at the scene. Those kinds of deception have an outsized risk of producing false confessions. Now, forensics. Now, this is an interesting area. This is an interesting area, and I'm really happy to be here at John Jay to have the people on the panel who are here, because John Jay has one of the best forensics departments in the country. Basic forensics, things like fingerprinting, uh, most of criminalistics are not science in the traditional sense of that word. It is not science. It is not data-based. It is based on human interpretation and therefore subject to human cognitive errors. And in most forensic laboratories, basic precautions against cognitive biases and errors are not taken. We can't actually reproduce the results in a dependable way because it's not being done according to data. It is being done in most laboratories through human interpretation and experience. I don't want to devalue experience, but it isn't all it's cracked up to be. There's more science for you. So what we have to do, according to what we have learned, is that we have to base our conclusions on hard data, like DNA does, and we have to take standard precautions against human biases in labs. Okay. You want some uh, context for this. This gentleman on the left is Brandon Mayfield, uh, a lawyer out in Portland, Oregon. Uh, Mr. Mayfield was arrested by the FBI uh, when, after the Madrid, Madrid excuse me, train bombings of several years ago, the Spanish police found, look all the way to the right, you see that smudgy fingerprint, a partial fingerprint on a bag in a car with some bomb parts. They, of course, digitized it and sent it out to all agencies in the world, all police agencies, and the FBI ran it through its automated fingerprint identification system. One of the candidates that popped out was Mr. Mayfield. Now, Mr. Mayfield had not been out of the country in at least 10 years. He didn't have a passport, <laughs> all right? But 
We did know some other things about him that found their way into the investigative process. He was a convert to Islam. He belonged to a mosque in Portland from which another completely unrelated terrorism case had sprouted several years before. So the FBI was all over this guy. They had him locked up. He was incarcerated for two weeks. The Spanish police in the meantime are saying, we don't like your match. We don't think it's right. FBI was saying, no, we had three people look at this. We had our top fingerprint guy, our former top fingerprint guy, and then the top independent fingerprint guy, and they all agree, 100% match. And then the Spanish police, after two weeks, said, we got the guy. It's really him. The, we got, it's him. You can let Mr. Mayfield go. All right? So none of this stuff is infallible, and yet, even in the aftermath of this debacle, you had people on TV and in the news saying things like, fingerprinting is infallible. It has a zero error rate. Why do we get this reaction? Generally, resistance to the idea of better practices and resistance to any change. And I want to emphasize, not all of law enforcement resists, but actually most of it still does. Here are some of the reasons that I've been given, that I have found in the literature, that I have found in from uh, recordings at press conferences, whatever you want. Uh, these are the top five I get all the time. None of these things hold any water. When you press hard on this, there are explanations for why this happens. Right? There are reasons that there is resistance, but it's not these five things. They generally come in two groups. Number one, cognitive biases. Number two, political or institutional biases. Here are cognitive biases, cognitive barriers, I've called them in the book. Biggest one by far, cognitive dissonance. A lot of you have probably heard this term. Police and prosecutors have a very definite idea of who they are. Their cultures are very strong, especially police, but not only police. They're the people in the white hats. They're the good versus the evil. But they also have this competing thought now the last 20 years because they know that in a certain number of cases, things have gone horribly wrong. And not because they were doing anything wrong necessarily, because they've been using procedures that no longer, we now know, work. The other big area where there are barriers, institutional and political barriers. So if you're in the police department, how do you get recognized as a good, aggressive, take charge officer? Close cases by arrest, lots of arrests. If you're a prosecutor, how do you advance in many prosecutor's officers? Conviction rate, right? Anything that looks like it might interfere with this, bad. Police culture, and I've singled out police here because their culture, as I said, is particularly strong particularly strong. It's us versus them. And I'm not telling any secrets here when I say this, but you know, you talk to police as I have. I train police. I'm with them. It's about, you know, if you haven't worn the uniform, if you don't wear the badge, you haven't carried the responsibility, you couldn't possibly understand. And ideas that come from the outside of the culture are especially suspect. So if those are some of the reasons for the resistance, how do we get past this? Even understanding the resistance, how do we get past it to something better, to where we have our best practices working in our justice system? I, I've put a very modest agenda here together, modest in the sense that the science could actually point us to some other things too, but I've just put down the things here where there's the greatest degree of consensus among all the people studying these things and all the people who've experienced them in law enforcement. So for eyewitness identification, blind administration, sequential lineups, proper instructions to a witness before they view a lineup, proper selection of the fillers, and confidence statements from the witness without any feedback. Next. For interrogation of suspects. Again, it's a pretty simple list. Record the whole interrogation. Not that just that part at the end with the confession, but the whole thing, front to back. Limit interrogation time. In a lot of these cases where there's a false confession, it's a 16, 18 hour interrogation. We, can, we, can, we know we can do better. And most interrogations take between two and four hours anyway. No fabrication of scientific test results. That would take a lot of the worst of this away. No promises of help and no threats should come from the interrogators. And for people in vulnerable groups, 
uh, mental problems, things like that, they should have an attorney present. Next, for forensics, another easy list. First, let's get rid of the junk. There's junk science in forensics as it's done now. All right? The number of cases that have come out of bite mark identification. That stuff shouldn't be in court. It just shouldn't. All right? So get rid of it. Put in customary, usual, and established procedures to eliminate human bias. Require proficiency testing. Not required. Not required. Standardized terminology. If I hear one more time an expert said, is consistent with, my head's going to blow up. Quality assurance. Do it in hospitals. Why not here? Conviction integrity units. This is important for every prosecutor's office. This has been done in Dallas, in Houston, now in New York City in the Manhattan DA's office. They have a dedicated unit within the prosecutor's office, the job of which is in any case in which there is a real, a serious doubt post-conviction, that unit or that prosecutor takes that case up and gives it a good hard study to see if there's anything that needs to be done. All right? So how do we make it happen? I've got six ideas for you. Six ideas. Okay? Uh, and I saw these things recur over and over in the case studies I looked at, the people I talked to, and so forth. Number one, focus on the future. In the past 15 years, we have, maybe by necessity, focused mostly on what went wrong in the past. Now let's focus on what we can do to stop it going forward. Because that's the way I think we can overcome some of that cognitive dissonance. If you tell people our effort is about improving the system, you can get some of them around the table who might not sit down with you if, if they thought this was about blaming them for the mistakes of the past. Number two, police and prosecutors need to be in the lead on this. For instance, Minnesota has been recording interrogations since the early 90s. Their Supreme Court said they had to do it. Alaska, same thing. And this was my favorite quotes from a guy somewhere in Minnesota, police captain, he says, Recording interrogations, that was the best reform ever shoved down our throats. <laughs> Point number three, lead from the right, not from the left. If you want real change, what I saw over and over in the places I looked was that you had to have a strong champion on the right. And this was necessary because many political leaders on the left, though they feel strongly about wrongful convictions or changing the system or whatever it is, many of them fear going forward in a strong way. They are afraid to get called soft on crime. Let's just call it like it is. That's it. Who wants to lose their election? Who wants to see that next attack ad? Joe Jones stood up for convicted criminals, but what has he ever done for you? People on the right, not so much. They have established their tough on crime bona fides. Nobody can call them soft, so it becomes Nixon going to China, for those of you who are old enough to remember who I'm talking about. All right? That's what you need. That works. Next, attach strings to money. This works too. The United States Department of Justice hands out billions of dollars every year. Billions to state and local police. So, you want our money? Put best practices in with regard to eyewitnesses, interrogations, forensics. You don't have to have our money. It's okay, you don't have to apply. But if you want it, we're expecting some action on these fronts. Preserving evidence. The Supreme Court says there's no constitutional command for states to preserve evidence. So states don't have to hold on to the evidence and preserve it beyond the last appeal. But we also know in today's DNA world that there are a lot of people walking around who are released after convictions who wouldn't be except that a state by its own rules held on to the evidence long after trial and then it could be tested when the technology came along. Last, judges and defense lawyers, I'm talking to you. Judges are the gatekeepers of the courtroom, and they're supposed to secure the courtroom against junk science, especially after the, the federal Daubert decision of, say, 15 years ago. Gatekeepers. That's the operative word. And you know what? They're good at it. 
when the evidence, the science, is evidence brought in in civil cases by plaintiffs who want to prove some large-scale injury, like breast implants leaking or something like that. Judges are great at figuring out what's junk science and throwing it out. They have a good record on that. But when the junk science is bite mark evidence, when it's other kinds of faulty or questionable forensic methods, not so much. The stuff comes in. They have to wake up. They have to do their jobs. And defense lawyers, you have to make them do it. You have to, you have to get up on your hind legs and bark. You've got to make noise. You've got to make those motions to tell the judge, judge, there's science out there that says this stuff's no good. Allow me to put on a witness or two for you. Because judges won't listen unless you do that. All right. I do think we owe it to our fellow citizens and to ourselves as Americans. I mean, if we have a good justice system, if that's what we want to say about ourselves, we have to be willing not to do perfection, but to reach out to do the best that our minds can allow us to do. It's not easy. It's not free. But if we have the will to do it, we can get there. And that's my interest in this. I want to thank you all for coming, and I look forward to hearing the comments of my pe fellow panelists. Thank you. Thank you. And there's no question, when you look at the research on the types of recommendations that uh, Professor Harris is recommending in terms of reforming eyewitness identification procedures, um, the research shows that, yes, they absolutely reduce uh, the risk of a mistaken identification. But they also reduce the number of correct identifications that are obtained. What people are concerned about is that, oh yeah, we're going to get fewer false identifications, but we're going to have this loss of hits. We're going to have this loss of correct identifications. And that's what people are focusing on is the loss, because we focus on loss. When you do that, those hits that you get, those extra hits you get from using those procedures, are really ill-gotten gains. Uh, so first I'd like to say uh, congratulations to Professor Harris on his book and I absolutely agree with uh, point number six that you made on one of your slides that uh, lawyers both sides not just prosecutors uh, because both sides use uh, scientific evidence uh, need to pick apart charlatan uh, witnesses and really make them explain themselves and explain their terminology if they think that is you know a an important part of their case and they're facing a charlatan expert witness um, and I also agree with a, I think a, a major premise of your book that much more research is needed to push out the frontiers of forensic science um, but I what I do not agree with, though, is a blanket ban on many procedures that are done in forensic science, uh, and mostly because of this. Uh, there is a lot of quantitative, falsifiable, testable research that has been published in tool mark analysis, which is my major area of studies. Uh, and for the physical evidence comparisons that, that I have seen, uh, in particular in tool marks, none has really refuted any of the major hypotheses in that field. Although, that said, I am a scientist, I am a falsificationist, and we have to continue to try to find that black swan. Although, those black swans, at what I would say at this point in time, really are black swans. Uh, they're not white swans. We're not, I don't think we're going to find two tools with enough characteristics in them that do make the same tool mark. Although, we need to build up algorithmic computational systems in order to try to disprove that hypothesis. What is correct today was not correct yesterday. In other words, things are changing. Science evolves. Science changes. We have to be very careful. Because in the early 90s, that's all we had. It was DNA. It was considered the gold standard. But let me tell you, it was no better than ABO because it was only one locus, one genetic site on the human cro chromosome. Uh, on the in the human genome. So again, people were convicted, people were sent away for a very long time based on one locus of information. And then we developed better technology and now we're doing what we call PCR of STRs, 
where we can uh, amplify 15 sites on the human genome simultaneously, all we need is a minuscule amount of, of uh, sample. But I have no doubt that tomorrow there's going to be another, uh, another direction that we will take. Uh, maybe we will get more sensitivity, maybe uh, we will learn that what we're doing now is primitive and, and there's an easier, faster, more economical way to do it. That's what science is. It goes on, it changes. Some of the problems with uh, impression evidence and the shoe print uh, evidence and footprint and tire track impressions uh, and bite mark evidence, all of these things, you, you need to make this stuff more quantitative. And, and that is really an area that is, is, is something that we have to move in. Why? Because if we make things more quantitative and you can do statistics, then you could talk about an error rate. I don't accept when people say, I did this analysis, I'm basing this, my conclusions on my skills and knowledge and experience, and what I say has to be true, I'm 100% certain and to a degree of scientific certainty, this is it. And there's no other question. I mean, the, the reality is, is there's always human error when you have humans doing work. The whole issue of vulnerability, which Professor Harris talked to, just one of the suggestions he made, any of, any of the p people in the room who watched the first 48, uh, which I think is a great show, right? Terrific show. Um, I think it gives you a good glimpse at what a homicide investigation looks like, you'll also see, at least the shows that I see, almost every one of those people could be described as vulnerable. That there's mental health issues, there's a lot of issues on, on the people that are being questioned. To say that any vulnerable person can have an attorney, just so we're clear, means that you will not be able to get a confession from any vulnerable person. So you want to make that very clear. No attorney, not even an entertainment lawyer, would walk into a police station standing with a client and let him talk so, so you may as well just say, we're not going to talk to anybody who's vulnerable, and that would be more, uh, more uh, forthright. Uh, and it, it reminds me of something that I remember as a cop, which also doesn't get a lot of attention, which is the greatest risk of a miscarriage is for predicate felons, um, which does not also fit into sometimes what the Innocence Project talks about. Um, the, the, the idea that a person with no prior contacts with criminal justice will be scooped off the street and prosecuted falsely that's much, much less likely to happy, happen than a scenario that you see a lot, which is that you arrest somebody for a robbery, you talk to the witness, their sh eyewitness identification is shaky, and you bring the person back to the precinct and you do a rap, you, you, you run the raps. And what do you see on the raps? Robbery, robbery, robbery. And what does that do in terms of your, uh, your, uh, the way you handle the case? What does that do in terms of the way a judge handles the case? Um, do we agonize about that eyewitness identification in the way we would in some other case? Absolutely not. So I just want to thank all of uh, Professor Harris and all of our panelists for wrestling with the, the, these difficult issues, and all of you for your uh, for your attendance. Thank you very much.